Josh and I ride to school each week. I bring him to school uh, Monday through Thursday out of the week, and we have about 15 minutes on the way to school. And one of the things we like to do, we've been doing for quite some time, is listening to audio books. We've been listening to U.S. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas's memoir. It's called My Grandfather's Son because his grandfather raised him like a daddy from the time he was a pretty young boy. And listening to that has caused me to be struck again with the power that stories, the stories that we believe, the power that the stories that we believe have to shape our lives. Thomas describes a period in his late teens, early 20s, when he began to believe a story that sounded about like this. He was an African American, grew up in uh, Georgia, lots of poverty, lots of the problems that, that were associated with racism. And so he had come to tell himself a story something like this. This country is hopelessly racist, but the man's never going to let me do anything. The church is nothing but hypocritical. My grandfather is too uneducated to see that my perspective on the world is right and his is wrong. And, and even violence might be the way to, to fix things. That's something of a sketch of, of, of a story that he believed, that he was telling himself in his late teens, early 20s. That story began to determine how he interpreted all of life. His whole outlook suffered. He boiled over with rage. He nearly threw away his future one night, participating with a violent mob. His relationship with his grandfather, daddy, uh, deteriorated. His mental health suffered. His relationship with God suffered. That's the power of story. And here's the thing. It wasn't that he couldn't point to real facts about his experience, about the world that he lived in, to validate that story. He certainly could. But what he came to see was despite the fact that he could point to real facts in his experience that validated something of that story, the story itself was nevertheless fundamentally, I mean, at bottom it was fundamentally untrue and it was harmful. That's the power of story. Do you think any stories like that could be shaping your life? Stories that may fit well, indeed do fit well with some parts of your experience. And yet fundamentally, at bottom, they misrepresent the world. And they're harmful. May God help us to see the truth about that today. Because some of the most powerful stories shaping our society are just like that. They're believable. And some of the facts of our experience fit well with them, but at bottom, they are profoundly false pictures of reality, of ultimate reality. And as we have believed those stories, we have become chaotic, we have become lost, sad, narcissistic, power-grasping, lonely, and as empty as those stories have shaped us to be. Why am I talking about story and the power of story? I'm talking about it because we came here to celebrate the ultimate story of reality. Easter Sunday is about the real story, and it's good news. It's good news. It's a story that begins and ends with God. It's about what he has done and what he is doing in this world, and it's about your place and my place in this world and what he's doing, our place as beloved but fallen children of God. The death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ are the crucial turn in this story where the fallen sons and daughters of God are rescued by the perfect Son of God, divine and human. The God who made himself like to us was the one who first made us like him. And that comes together in Easter as he comes to us where we are lost in darkness, trapped in sin, subject to death, so that he can lead us out of that into goodness and light and life beyond now and in the glorious age to come. That's Easter. And the good news is that the story of Jesus' resurrection is the real story. It's the ultimate story. And by our faith in Jesus, his story becomes our story. Would y'all pray with me? Father, this is your word and this is your story and it's for us and it's good news. We ask you to help us today to hear your word for what it is, the very word of the living God and to respond in whatever way you're leading us to respond. Worship, faith, repentance, belief, hope. Give us that grace today in Jesus' name.
Amen. As I mentioned, we're going to cover just one verse of the scripture that summarizes the key elements of the story of Jesus' resurrection. What we're going to find is that his suffering was ours. We're going to find that he really did arise from the dead. That happened in space and in time. And that by faith, his story becomes our story. This is Acts, book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 3. The scripture says he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Let's begin with the first part of that, that that phrase, after his suffering. This, of course, refers to Jesus' resurrection, but let me set the context for that so we see the meaning of Jesus' suffering in its broader picture 2,000 years ago it was in the fullness of time as the scripture calls it a light came into the world the true light as John wrote that shines into the world into our deepest darkness and enlightens all who come into it his birth was proclaimed by angels who announced good news of great joy for all the people because the savior of the world Christ the Lord has been born he the eternal God enters time He, the uncreated God, created everything, becomes a human being, puts on our nature, veiling his unapproachable light in flesh and blood so that we could know him the better and so that he could do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. He had a mom and a dad. He lived in a rural community with family and friends. He bumped his head and he scraped his knees. He laughed. He cried. He went to school, he learned a trade, he lived among us as one of us. He showed us the glory of God in flesh and blood. He taught us truth, beauty, and righteousness. He loved the unlovely. He had compassion on the marginalized and mercy for the sinner. He came to seek and save that which was lost so that even though he was the king of heaven, he didn't come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Though there was no evil found in him, he was assigned a grave with the accursed. He was betrayed, he was mocked, he was scourged, and he was crucified, and it was a ghastly scene. Crucifixion was designed to inflict humiliation, desecration, torment, punitive suffering, and ultimately death on its victims. They hung a sign above him, to mock him, to warn that there's no king but Caesar. And yet that testament remains to this day for us that there is no king like Jesus. The crowds that were massed, many cried, crucify. Their leaders witnessed the death of the one whom they called a troublemaker and a blasphemer. Those few followers of Jesus who knew him as Lord saw truth and justice die, abandoned on the cross as the innocent one hung under the condemnation of all the guilty ones and his life was taken from the one who came to give it. They witnessed the depths of human hate as violent men tore his flesh with whips then nailed his body to a cross while gawking onlookers mocked and jeered. They saw the shameful desecration of the holy of holies incarnate as his viciously beaten and torn body hung naked at eye level on a hill for the whole world to see until finally his head dropped and he breathed his last after his suffering after his suffering what was this suffering what is the meaning of this we read last week in our Lord's Supper service a passage from Isaiah and I want to share a Brief part of it again. This was written hundreds of years before these events. God spoke through this prophet the meaning of this suffering. And it says this. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. 
All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. What is this suffering? It's our suffering. He didn't just look like us. He became one of us. This is our suffering. Not his by nature. His by choice. There are two things I want you to see about his suffering. The first is that he died for us. He died for us. The weight of the wrongs that we do, the weight of the wrongs that we do can only be lifted by forgiveness. All of us know something of the weight of the wrongs that we do and probably all of us know something of the lifting of those weights by forgiveness. The meaning of Jesus' suffering is that the weight of the wrongs that we do can be lifted only by forgiveness. And Jesus died to make that ultimate forgiveness a reality. There is Jesus, Son of God, Son of Man, standing between holy God and unholy man, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us to God through forgiveness. That's God's answer to the problem of our evil. That's God's answer to our sins, justice and forgiveness. And God there willingly choosing to pay the price for both. He died for us. He also suffers with us. It may be that you're here and you are burdened by the weight of of guilt that you carry. Sometimes it's all that a person can do to keep a good face because of what's happening inside Because that weight is so heavy. It will burden and it will bend. And we see even a picture of this as Jesus was burdened beneath that cross, carrying it up Golgotha Hill. Much like we are buried beneath a false self by the weight of our guilt. That's our burden he's carrying. Those are our anxieties that he's pouring out in the Garden of Gethsemane in the wee hours of Good Friday morning. His suffering was our suffering. But it's not just what we have done. The reality is it's not just what we have done, our evil. It's what we've experienced. It's the evil that we have experienced in this world. It's what's been done to us. The harms, the betrayals, the abuses, the traumatic shocks, the devastating losses, the abandonments, the aloneness, the aches, the disappointments, the things a kid should never see. The things a person should not experience. All of it. He was betrayed by a close friend. He was abandoned in his most desperate need. He was slandered. He was blamed. He was maligned without cause. He was beaten mercilessly and mocked in his pain. Our darkness and our groans became his as he groaned from the cross when darkness covered the whole land. It was our burden. It was our burden that bowed him. It was our burden that he carried to that cross. His suffering was our suffering. Even now, Christian, Christ is with you in your suffering because that is what love does. That's what love does. Love moves into the suffering of others and suffers with. That's what we mean by compassion, to suffer with. And Jesus' limitless compassion took him into all of our suffering, even to the point of death with us. Now make no mistake about it, love, love, real love, God's love, love just like this. This is what is missing in too many of the stories that we are living into. Too many of the stories that we believe this is what's missing. This, God's Love That something that just seems to be missing in our lives, that something is God's love. You might be religious, you might not be religious. That something that's missing is this. We might know about it in the abstract, but until we come to receive it, until we let our guard down and let Jesus love us like this, really and personally, we do not experience the most important thing that we need to experience, the fact that God loves us. Jesus said, as the cross drew near, he said, greater love has no one than this. Then he lay his life down for his friends. 
Jesus would have all of us as friends. And mark this, we need to be careful. Not buddies. Not the cheap way that we have friends sometimes in this world. Maybe the closest thing to it is best friend. Jesus would have us as friends because the mark of friendship is love. You may know this. Philos, the Greek term for friend, the verb phileo means love. That's the mark of friendship and that's what Jesus would have with all of us. A relationship that's centered on the love that he has for us and that we have for him. That's why our suffering by his choice became his suffering. But that wasn't the end of the story. They took his broken, bloodied body down from the cross. They hurried him to a nearby tomb where he was buried according to Jewish custom. The tomb was sealed. A guard was set and all was silent as that day passed into night. And that night into the next day. And then into the dawn of the third day when the earth shook with violent force. As an angel appeared and rolled the stone away before the terrified eyes of those soldiers who had been set to guard it. The few women who came upon the scene shortly thereafter found the tomb empty and heard the angel declaring, just like he had before, once again, good news of great joy for all the people. And this time it was, he is not here. He is risen. In the hours that followed, their joy was mingled with much confusion and doubt, but over a period of 40 days, as our text today says, Jesus presented himself alive After his sufferings by many proofs and speaking about the kingdom of God to his followers. Let's turn to that second phrase. By many proofs. The resurrection of Jesus Christ really happened in space and time. It's not just a story that we believe like a fictional thing. It's a story that's true that's based in what God actually did and is continuing to do. His resurrection really happened. The reason that Jesus' followers proclaimed his resurrection was because they were convinced it happened. The reason they were convinced it happened were these experiences of Jesus alive again after his death over a period of 40 days until the ascension and subsequent gift of his spirit to the church. The reason this proclamation continues to convince others right up to the present day including me, even though I'm not an eyewitness to these things, is because Jesus is still teaching the world the good news, the truth about his resurrection through his spirit-filled church to this present day. That's why it continues. And yet, many say, I cannot believe such a thing ever happened or could even happen. And understand that. I have a skeptical bent of my own. And I can understand the questioning of that. I know that for some people, maybe some of you here, this is a hindrance. It's a real hindrance to belief. So I want to talk about many convincing proofs and the objections that have been raised in our present day so that maybe you can see some of these common objections to the real story of Jesus' resurrection. They're fluff. They're empty. Let's start with the science objection. And I, I put science in scare quotes now. Because it's not really a scientific objection. It's actually a philosophical objection that has a science mask on it. Okay, and I'll show you that in just a second. But let's, talk, let's look at it this way. What do I mean? The Christian claim, the Christian claim that Jesus was resurrected and current scientific understanding are in perfect agreement about the fact that dead people do not naturally come to life again. There's no, there's no process we've ever observed where that can happen. We're in complete agreement about that fact. Science, by design, investigates and describes natural phenomena. Jesus' resurrection, however, was not a natural phenomenon. Such a thing, if it happened, would be a miracle, a supernatural phenomenon. And that's exactly what the Christian claim is. Now, here's the rub. The rub is that it has become fashionable to say that science says miracles like this can never happen. That is nonsense. It's complete nonsense. It's not a scientific claim, it's a philosophical claim. Just because a guy with a science coat, you know, lab coat on says this is what science says doesn't mean it's what science says. It's a philosophical claim with a science mask on. It's not what science says, it's a myth that science and God are in conflict somehow. It's just a myth. But that myth has been so drummed into the popular consciousness that people think they have to choose between. Which brings us to the real issue. 
under that claim. It's a philosophical issue. It's a philosophical issue. The term for it is naturalism. The idea that there's no God, no miracles, no supernatural, nothing like this can happen is a philosophy. It's called naturalism. And naturalism has been favored for about 150 years. It's been growing in its, in its power and strength. And it's, it's favored by people who like, for example, C.S. Lewis, before he was a Christian, when he was an atheist, he liked naturalism. And the reason he liked it was because there wasn't a God to interfere with him and all his plans for his life. He liked that. He later came to believe that that was a foolish desire that had the seed of hell in it and benefited him nothing. But that's how he thought at the time. What about naturalism? The problem with naturalism is it doesn't fit the world that we live in. What do you mean, Justin? If naturalism is true, there is no objective right and wrong. Does your experience lead you to believe that there is no objective difference between a concentration camp in 1940s Germany and MD Anderson? Does your experience lead you to believe that there's no difference between a concentration camp and a hospital? If naturalism is true, you have no ground to say that there's any objective difference between those two. That's the problem. It's a nice idea that fits some of our experience, but not enough. It's a poor fit for much of our experience, in fact. The existence of right and wrong, the law-like behavior of the universe, the apparent design for life, the existence of information and of logic and of consciousness, not to mention love, all point away from naturalism because in our experience, uniform experience, responsibility for right and wrong only comes from moral obligations. There has to be someone to whom we're responsible Laws come from lawgivers, design from designers, information from intelligence, and so on. So again, I say to you, the Christian claim is that the same supernatural God who created everything from nothing and became incarnate in Jesus Christ is responsible for his supernatural resurrection. Okay, Justin, maybe I'm going to give you that much. Maybe I'm willing to listen a little bit more about this supernatural resurrection thing. But what evidence is there that this really happened? That's the historical objection. The historical objection. By the way, is the kind of thing that that, that people think because they just haven't, they don't know. They're not aware of the information. They don't realize that after a couple hundred years of critical historical scholarship into the historical Jesus, there is a mountain of evidence that Jesus was resurrected. What do I mean? What a couple of hundred years of historical inquiry into Jesus' resurrection has produced is stronger confidence in the historical truth of Jesus' resurrection, not less confidence. The reason is simple. No other explanation of the relevant historical facts does nearly as well as the claim that Jesus actually rose from the dead. In a nutshell, here's the information. First, Jesus was crucified by the Romans under Pontius Pilate. That is a fact that no historian of any ideological perspective disputes. This is a fact of history. Atheist, agnostic, whatever, doesn't matter. Historians in this field of all persuasions would tell you that is a fact, that's what happened. Shortly thereafter, Jesus' disciples had, listen, this is important, real experiences Real experiences that led them to believe and to proclaim that he had been resurrected. Again, that is a fact acknowledged by a virtually unanimous consensus of scholars, including many skeptical scholars. Atheists, again, agnostics, would tell you that is a fact. They had a real experience of some kind. We may not be ready to say they had a resurrection. We may not be ready to talk about what God did, but they didn't make this stuff up. Something really happened to them. The disbelieving and foremost persecutor of the fledgling church, Saul of Tarsus, had a similar kind of experience that led him to believe in Jesus' resurrection and to preach to others at great cost to himself. Again, fact. Fact. First century Jews suddenly began to worship a crucified man as God. Who saw that one coming? Fact. They began to worship on the first day of the week, calling it the Lord's Day, in contradiction to the, to the Sabbath. They worshiped on Sunday. Fact. They spoke of sharing in his body and blood. Fact. They suffered ostracism, torture, death, not in a moment, but for decades and never wavered in their belief. They saw loved ones suffer the same way. Fact. Therefore, 
It is utterly improbable that anyone would do something like this for something that they had even the shred of a doubt about, much less knew to be a lie. Their opponents were unable to produce Jesus' body, nor were they by any other means able to successfully contradict the Christian claim, even though first century Christians were preaching this message in the very city where Jesus died, where the tomb still stood. These facts demand an explanation, and one was given by multiple independent eyewitnesses. The explanation was he is risen. The same God who made you, made me, who made everything that is, who became incarnate in Jesus Christ, rose from the dead after his sufferings. That's what happened. That's the real story of Jesus' resurrection. And that brings us to the most important issue or objection, the heart objection. In the mid-1980s, Lee Strobel was a highly successful journalist, having studied journalism at Mizzou and law at Yale. He had risen to become the legal editor of the Chicago Tribune. He prided himself on his rationalism, and he concluded that there was no God And the goal of life was to pursue as much pleasure as he could find. Despite his pursuit of one high, as he put it, after another, he was a very unhappy man given to fits of rage and bouts of drunkenness. He says, the ugliest thing about me is that when I would come home from a day at work, my little girl would instinctively get up and as she heard me coming would get up, pick her toys up, and go into her room and shut the door. That was the kind of presence that he was. Though he wouldn't have known it at the time, he wouldn't have known why, he later concluded that he was so angry because of how empty his life really was. The highs, the successes, the pleasures were never enough. His wife who had never had any kind of religious belief, made a friend who was a Christian. And one day his wife upset his whole world by coming home and telling Lee that she had become a follower of Jesus Christ. There were some changes that were interesting and attractive, but on the whole, he just wanted his old life back. And so he decided, well, these people believe that a dead guy lived again. I ought to be able to debunk that So I'm going to take a weekend, gather some of the necessary facts, and I'm going to prove to my wife that this never happened. A weekend turned into two years as he spent those two years researching every minute aspect of scholarship concerning the Christian claim that Jesus rose from the dead. And after two years, the once hard as flint atheist Lee Strobel realized that he couldn't deny the evidence and concluded that the last issue was in fact a heart issue. I can't deny the evidence anymore, but what am I going to do about it? What am I going to do about it? He shared that with his wife, who turned around and shared with him a verse of Scripture in John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 12, that says, To as many as receive him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. Born not of flesh and blood, not of the will of man, but born of God. He was born again. That's what we mean by that. He was born again. He was reborn. His own heart came to new life. He experienced the very thing that's in the last part of this text that Jesus spoke to after his sufferings. By many proofs, he appeared and and taught them, spoke to them about the kingdom of God. That's That's what Lee Strobel experienced. The kingdom of God. The same thing that these first believers in the resurrection experienced. The kingdom of God with its forgiveness, its righteousness, its joy, and its peace. That transformed Lee's relationship with God, with his wife, with his family, with the world around him. It gave him a new future in the now and it gave him a new future in the life, the age to come. And I wonder, do you need that? Do you need that? See, the good news, the gospel is that Jesus' resurrection is the real story. And that by our faith in Jesus, the real story becomes our story. That's what faith is. 
That's what faith is. The belief that Jesus' resurrection is the real story of ultimate reality so that I'm going to align my life with that. Jesus says, come, follow me. And those that get up and follow find that his story becomes theirs. Some of you today I know have been hurt so many times and for so long it is hard to believe anything so good. Please hear this. As Jesus' story becomes our story, God uses Jesus' wounds to heal us. And then somehow he turns around and he uses our wounds to be Jesus' healing to other people. The story becomes our story. I'm going to leave you there now with that as we move into a time of response I'll say that at the conclusion of the service, I'll be around. I would love to meet anyone that I haven't got a chance to meet. If you have a question about Jesus, about this faith that we've preached today, about how to become a part of this church, anything like that, I'd love to visit with you, and uh, I'd love to pray with you. So I'll be around at the conclusion of our service for that. But Pray with me now, and then we'll enter into a time of reflection and response. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. What words can we say? Thank you. As we come now into this time of response to reflect on the things that we've heard from the scriptures, give us the grace to hear your voice speaking to us through them, to receive the word of God for what it is, the very word of the living God, to respond in faith and repentance. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.